Hello, and welcome to a special episode of Disrupt Your Now, the show for entrepreneurs who are ready to shake things up, sick and tired of checking off the boxes. Today, I have a really fun guest who is not our typical guest. Douglas Terrell is an actor, writer, director, everything, historian. And the first time I ever heard of Douglas, or I guess we met on LinkedIn, but he had a new TV series coming out that he had written, acted in, and directed called Landing Home. And I watched it right after we met. I watched it on, I believe it was Prime. And I just was blown away. I loved it. My, As you know, Douglas, my husband's retired Navy, but I felt like that show came from an angle that different from most um, shows about that topic, about military people coming home, service members yeah. coming home. So anyway, the reason I have him on the show today is because I want y'all to understand that no matter what you do, there's an entrepreneurial as aspect to it. And one of the things that Douglas does is a solo show. And one of those solo shows was actually commissioned by the Library of Congress. So um, I have Douglas on to talk about the really cool things that he has done and how he has taken his acting career in really new directions through entrepreneurship. Welcome to the show, Douglas. Oh, thanks for having me, Lisa. It's a pleasure. Yeah. It's a pleasure to be here. It's so nice to have you and finally get to talk to you for all these after all these years. We first met, I believe, in 2020. Yeah, it was right during COVID, right? And it was, that was right when I released Landing Home. Yeah, I was looking back at our um, LinkedIn messages and you were like, oh, the trailer's out now. Here's the link. And <laughs> so I watched that and then it was like a few days after that that it came out. It's hard yeah. to believe it's been that long ago. Yeah, not a great time to release a film. <laughs> yeah, but everybody's stuck at home and so Yeah, I, I, people say that, but you know that when you're in production, you're constantly, you know, you can't, you know, can we meet? Can we not meet? You oh, know, yeah, who's, yeah. whose studio do we go to? So, yeah. but yeah, but it gets done, you know, you always find a way to get things done. Yeah. Well, I want you to introduce yourself to the audience. Give them some background about where you came from, how you got to where you are today before we take it and run with it. Sure. So I, I've been in acting um, for, for a while now. I'm probably, I'm, I'm guessing 23, 24 years. I got into it in college. Uh, I was over a girl. I was, you know, <laughs> of course, I, I always, I was uh, in love with a girl and we had broken up right after high school. And so in college, I wanted to do something to kind of impress her. And so there was a kid in English class. He said, um, hey, um, you know, he was, a talk I'll never forget his name to this day his name is marcus wiley and he said uh i'm auditioning for these for the children's show you know and he had a, an incredible bubbly sense of humor he was just so happy and excited he was just like it was almost like he was auditioning for the academy awards or something and i said well you know can anybody audition he goes yeah anybody can audition and i said when is it he goes oh, it's right after it's after class it's run in the afternoon so anyhow i went and auditioned and it was for a children play and and the director, her name was Pat Baldwin. She said, you know, okay, what kind of animals can you be? And so I used to break dance, not very good, but I used oh, to break man, dance. Oh man, I want to see it, Douglas. <laughs> and so I, uh, I did an alligator break dancing as an alligator. And, uh, anyway, I got cast and she gave me a scholarship and that's how I started acting at Ole Miss. And then, um, after Ole Miss, uh, you know, I kind of, you do what you do as, a, as an actor, you take, you know, day jobs and wait tables and you pursue. And then I went to New York and I pursued, I was blessed to study with a very talented director. His name was Wynn Hadman. He passed away during COVID. He was, he was 95, mm. 96, but he was, he was the who's who to audition for, to work with. He, he has directed everybody from, I mean, De Niro, uh, Al Pacino, Dustin Hoffman. I mean, he was the who's wow. who. He was really the mentor you wanted to get into. And you had to audition um, to get into his class. And, and you had, to, I'm sorry, you had to audition to audition to get into his class. Mm -hmm. So you had to go through this whole filter process. You know, and, and, you know, the monologue I did was from a play called Tally and Son by Lance for Wilson. And it's of a funny how life is, you know, sometimes the things you're doing later in life, you can, you can trace back from a very beginning seed. And when I auditioned, um, in some, in college, a director gave me this monologue 
from Tally and Son. It's a dead Vietnam soldier who uh, who actually comes back and he goes to his house and he sees his family and he kind of notices people who have moved on, people who are still grieving. And it's it's, it's all about Vietnam. And 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 he, it's just a reflection, you know, how life moves on when you lose someone in combat. And yeah. um, I have so I did, bumps. Yeah, it was really, it's a beautiful play by Lansford Wilson. So I did the play, I mean, I did the monologue and, you know, little did I know that, you know, many, many years later, I would be doing the American soldier, which is very similar to that one monologue. And that's, yeah. and that's the monologue that got me into wins class. And so, you know, you know, I was in, I moved there in 2000. Um, I, I can't, you know, a lot of, a lot of the things that I do now are kind of, I can always trace back from, I, I came out of the North towers when nine 11 happened. So, oh, wow. So I remember that very vividly. And, and, um, so you were in the tower when it happened? Yeah, I was. So I used to, one of my day jobs was a personal trainer. So uh, my, my gym was about, it was about a 10 minute walk from North, mm -hmm. North, the North, the twin towers. To, Cause there was always, there's actually three towers. People don't know that there was the North, the South and the West tower. Yeah. Uh, I believe it's the West tower, but, um, I was coming out of the North tower around eight 30 and I was walking 10 minutes and then the first plane hit. Mm -hmm. um, so I got to see everything there. And so I, that's really where my passion for the American soldier came because I was just, um, I became really obsessed with what was happening in the middle East and, uh, yeah. you know, living in New York, you know, the, you know, New York is very jaded and I wanted people to understand that, you know, this is going by 2005, 2006, it kind of felt like you know the the country was trying to move on, but this, specifically the city was trying to move on. But it was really weird because we were trying to move on, but we still had the very visible scars of yeah of the, of the twin towers not being there. So anyhow, I have another friend that was there that day, Michael Hinkson. He's the blind guy that made it out with his guide dog. Oh, I haven't. And heard it was that. a movie. He had a book about it in Thunder Dog in a movie. Uh, before we go on, I want to ask yeah. you, can you shift over a little half your faces? Oh. There you go. Yeah, there you go. So we can see your whole face. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Um. So, wow. So it you mentioned, and I'm, I want you to pick back up where you're going, but I want the audience to remember that you mentioned two things already that they should be thinking about. A mentor yeah. and how everything you do ties back you can see these ties from throughout your life yeah and i i always share that with even younger actors who are trying to get into the business you you just don't know what stern what stone you turn over what it's going to lead you so if i were to go backwards to kind of really give you the whole process so after i graduated from um uh, from Ole miss i came back to houston and you know uh, i was uh i was waiting tables, auditioning, trying to, you know, find, figure out what I can do. And, um, but I had a tr tremendous passion. So I got cast in a play here in a local theater and there was a really sweet actor who I'm still friends with. Um, and he said, uh, I mean, you know, you're, you, you seem like you have a lot of passion. You're really talented. There's a guy who's coming, who's teaching a workshop. You should really, um, you should, you should think about doing the workshop. So I did, his name was Stanley Zeroff and I'm still friends with him. And, um, you know, it was it was an acting workshop here here in uh, in in Houston. And when I was studying with him, he said, you know, he loved what I was doing. He said, you know, you know, at some point you're going to have to leave Houston. You're going to either have to go to L.A. or New York. You know, if you ever go to New York, you let me know because there's a guy named there named Wynn Hanman. You should audition for him. So I said, okay. Well, when I always tell people, you you always grab people's contact information. Yes. Because you just don't know where it's going to lead where what mm -hmm. it's going to lead to so sure enough i met my my wife now but my the, uh, my girlfriend then and she wanted to she was working in oil and so she wanted to go to grad school and so we were just dating at that time and i she said look if i'm going to apply to the east coast and the west coast and if i get accepted either way either la or new york why don't we go together if it doesn't work out we're both in a city that we both want to be in right and mm -hmm. you know we're not in topeka kansas where one of us is screwed or something <laughs> yeah <laughs> so um she got to new york and we went to new york so the moment i got to new york i reached out to stanley zeroff said hey stanley you know i took your workshop i just wanted to let you know that i'm here in new york you know and i would love to get that contact information from you to audition for wins class 
And to be honest with you, that workshop changed the tra trajectory of my life. Because if it wasn't for that workshop, I would have never got into Wins class. I would have never become the actor I I've become. And I would have never been inspired and trained the way I was trained. Wow. And um, you just and, and you just never know what opportunity is. And I, a lot of times when I talk to younger people and I give them a contact or a, a, a lead or something, it's really sad, but it's really shocking to me that they don't follow up on it. Yeah. Right? You know, mm -hmm. and, and they're like, Oh, whatever. And, you know, and it, it's such a missed opportunity that you, um, you just, you turn every single stone over. And as an actor, you have to, cause you don't know if you cast to a, you know, the whole thinking of an actor is you got to do a play and especially in New York, you know, you're doing plays in middle of nowhere, Brooklyn or, or Long Island or something. And you're like, no one's going to see this. Nobody from the industry is going to see this, but you don't know who's in the play, who sees it, who's yeah. connected to who, who's connected to who, and it keeps bouncing around. And so it's really important, as you said, to really follow up and, and just, just, um, tackle every single opportunity you can possibly get. That's such a great point. You never know who is going to see something or who that knows somebody is going to see. It. Just don't know. You um, don't know. You remind me of my cousin who ended up in New York as well. He, when he was in high school, he really wanted to get into the music industry, writing and producing. And when he was in high school, he wrote, he created a job for his local paper so that he could go to the civic center and, um, interview musicians and their managers and stuff. And this was like in the sixties before people were really doing that. They're like, this is stupid, but go, you're a kid. So he collected business cards and held on to them. And he ended up um, hearing this group singing when he's walking down the streets, like around DC, went in and signed them, called one of the guys that he had the business card for, ended up Sign, going up like in a couple of days, long story short, that guy connected him with yeah. ben McCoy, the hustle. They yeah. ended up starting McCoy Kipps Productions. But that very first group that Buddy signed was the presidents. And that very first song was Grammy nominated, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years of love. And that was from a business card that he got as like a 17 year old from a civic center where his employer thought this is stupid, but go do it. You know? Yeah. And I'm, I'm notorious. I mean, the reason why I'm on this podcast with you is because the moment I met, well, I was, I can't remember how we got connected, mm -hmm. but I don't know. I know it was on LinkedIn, but, I, but anyway, yeah. I followed through. I mean, I, I'm a big believer in following through and a lot of it came, comes from, you know, I got into acting late. So I always felt like I so this, you know, you always have these stigmas. I always felt like I wasn't a good actor. And so I always felt like I had to work a little bit harder than everybody else. Um, because a lot of the people I, who I, especially even in New York, when I was in wins class, you know, people had been studying acting since they were kids, since they were, yeah, you know, you know toddlers. And so, so I always took every, I cherished every single opportunity, you know, a casting call, an audition, a booking, a contact. And so, and that's still, I'm still the exact same way. I mean, if I get a lead, I, I'll, 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 I'll organize a lead. I'll make sure I reach out to them. You know, a lot of the press that I've gotten from the American soldiers, is the exact same way, you know, mm -hmm. persistency is a really key. I stay on top of people. I say, let them know, Hey, I just want to let you know, I'm performing in Tennessee, you know, and, um, excuse me, I'm about to sneeze. Oh. <laughs> Bless you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you get, you know, you just don't know where these opportunities are going to come from and you really, you just have to, you have to tackle everything. And it's kind of the story of life, to be honest with you. I mean, it that's is. really how success happens. Yeah. People think, oh, so-and-so has so much more than I do. I could never do it. And they don't understand that if you haven't had to go through the hard patches that you don't even know how to begin to go through them. And I didn't realize that you started later than most people in your field. That's like Colin, our, our race car driver. Yeah. He didn't start racing until he was 15. And most professional drivers start go driving cars. carts when they're like three or four. And he yeah. started when he was almost 15 and won in his first championship, like I think in his third season. So um, but anyway, it, that's a great point that you have to work harder and yeah, you have to work hard as well. You know I mean? You can't, you know, yeah. you can't just reach out to people and not do anything. You know, you, you, you have mm -hmm. to kind of, I always, I always compare. So you have to keep the, the cheese turning, you know, and then, and then as you, 
you know, as you reach out to people, they see you churning cheese and they want to work with you, right? You can't just be sitting on your couch and say, hey, you know, yeah, can, can you give me an opportunity and you're not doing anything? Yeah, um, you can't just ask for people to give, give, give. And that's another thing. You also have to look for ways that you can help other people. Yeah, What absolutely. can you do? Um, and in a genuine way, not in a way that people feel. Yeah, it, it, it always, whatever. you know, um, it's the law of physics, right? You know, for every action, there's an opposite equal reaction. And yeah. you have to, and you have to kind of use that in, in business and networking, you know, reach out. Mm -hmm. Simple things like congratulate people, check mm -hmm. in on people. I hope, you know, I hope your family's doing well. Our congratulations on the XYZ award. What can I do to help? Share people's content. You know, mm -hmm. I, as an actor, I would always go, so a lot of times an actor, obviously it's a very selfish profession because you have, you're so focused on yourself and moving yourself, but it's, it's so easy to just to go support people and see them in plays. And yeah, I made that a really, and I made that part of my networking, um, to go always, if a friend was in a play, I'd go see their play. Um, if I knew somebody who I wanted to, I wanted to work with, I'd go see their player or I, I'd, I'd write them say, I just saw your play. Even if it was a casting director, mm -hmm. I just saw your play. It's amazing. I love the way you did the casting. You know, um, I love the work with you down the road. And, you know, you're always putting, you know, emotional deposits because if you're always looking for emotional withdrawals, you can yeah. never, you, you, there's not enough in the bank, right? So you have to deposit, deposit, deposit. And ideally you want to deposit more than you withdraw. Yeah. And sometimes people are always trying to withdraw more than the deposit. And that always feels very jaded and feels very like you're, and when people do that towards you, you feel like you're being used. Yeah. And one of the places that that is the most obvious is on LinkedIn. It's like the yeah. minute you connect with somebody and you get that pitch message and you're just like, uh, you know, yeah. and it's like, well, I, I got a um a message like a month or so ago that there was a connection request. And I was like, I don't know, this just doesn't feel right. But then I was like, well, I'll accept it. And I immediately get this message saying, oh, I hope you're enjoying your new position and I hope things are going great. And and I'm like, I've owned my business since 1996. You don't know a dang thing about me. And, and it's funny because I use that as an, a, le a lesson on a LinkedIn post of course. I block blurt out the person's name. And one of my friends that's known me for a long time goes, he goes, well, I hope you're settling in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, just, it, just, it, <laughs> it just starts to feel very shallow, you know, and then, you, and, and then you lose trust right away because right. you're like, well, this person is, just... <laughs> we're all really, you know, as human beings, you know, we're all very smart, intuitive, yeah. and it doesn't, I mean, unless you're just, you're missing a screw upstairs, you know, when you're being used, right. right? And it doesn't and then, it doesn't take long for you to feel yeah. like this, it, that icky feeling like, okay, this is all one-sided. This is mm -hmm. not genuine in any way. And this is not something I can grow with or build. And so. Yeah. And in know. that case, it's like, okay, you're either, either really selfish and ignorant or you have a virtual assistant or something that's just slamming things out, whoops, slamming things out, or it's a bot either way, whatever the three are, N not for me. <laughs> you know, so y'all out there take Douglas's advice and deposit, deposit, deposit. Don't try to withdraw right away. Yeah. I mean, that's really the key. I, and I, I've always been, I've always been really pro Again, it goes back from the, the days. I mean, part of it has been taught from my parents. My dad was uh, an immigrant here from Argentina and he's passed, but oh. he, he always had, he had a great saying, you know, I mean, and it's a little bit different, but I took it to mean the same thing. He says, you know, if you dress like a bum, people will treat you like a bum. Mm -hmm. So I always took that to how you treat people is how you'll get treated. Yeah. And and so, man, because I always felt insecure about my craft as an actor, I always was making sure that I was trying to please people, right? And mm -hmm. if you, you want to go even go back with the American Soldier, when I started kind of creating this play and it was really raw and I was just doing research i had um i studied with alec baldwin many years back mm. uh, i studied with him for about three summers as if you put aside his craziness and the recent tragedies he's dealing with yeah. right now he's actually a, he he he's very astute when it comes to theater he's really theater trained and mm -hmm. he, you know, he would have been a lawyer and his family's history is really interesting and uh, he would have been an amazing director but anyhow uh different story for a different podcast um mm -hmm. But I studied with a girl named Daniel, uh, Daniela, 
and we became really good friends. And the same the way the way I treated her is the same way I, you know, as we're talking about deposit, you know, and she would do a scene. It's really good the way you're doing. And like, and we, we brainstormed. So anyhow, when I got, uh, when I was looking for a director, she found my director, um, and I had reached out to um, um, to somebody else. Um, I forgot how I reached out, but I took when I was writing it, I. I got, I, someone said, you know, you need to get in a writing class, you know, to kind of get some ideas. And so I studied with Craig Lucas. Craig Lucas wrote the movie Prelude to a Kiss. I don't know if you heard Prelude yeah. to a Kiss. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But he's actually a very prolific um, uh, playwright. Um, he's, won, he's, he's won a Tony for, I think, two plays for American Piazza, uh, Prelude for the Kiss. Uh, he's, he's, he's amazing. And I'm still friends with him to this day. So when I was in his class, he said, you know, I don't think you have a play. I think what you have is, is, is a solo show. And I was like, Oh my gosh, interesting. I, I never, you know, and, and I didn't really take it to heart cause I'd never thought I could do a solo show again, going back to my insecurities because you know, to be on stage, talk for 60, 75 minutes by yourself. You're like that's, that's a different kind of actor. I'm not that, yeah. kind of, I'm not that kind of actor, <laughs> but he really pushed me. And, and so he, we stayed in contact and he wrote me an email and he said, you should reach out to a couple of directors. And so he gave me a director. She was pretty, she was way further in her career than, than I was. And she said, I think what you're doing is this is in 2006, 2007. She said, like, you know, I think what you're doing is really interesting. I don't think I'm, I'm the right director, but you should re reach out to this group that I know of. They do a lot of really indie and raw kind of stuff. And when it was it was called Lab Rats. And when I when I looked at, when I looked them up, I realized Daniela, who I study with and with Alec Baldwin, she was the artistic director. Oh, wow. The small group. So I reached out to her and, you know, and even though New York is small, it's, it could feel like you're living in two different states, five different states, because everyone's in the, especially as actors, we're all churning butter on our own way and yeah. doing our own projects. And we just, it's, you know, we, sometimes you don't ever cross, you'll work with someone on a project and you'll, you won't ever see them again. Mm -hmm. Um, so I told her what I was doing and she's like, you know, I don't think we're right for it, but I know a director who might be right for it. And his name was Patrick Lillis. And he was the one who directed my play. So going back to the connection again, you, the way you treat, the way you make deposits and the way you follow through, follow through is the other thing that I would just hammer to people. Mm -hmm. You just got to follow through. You just have to follow through. And I always have a phrase. If they say no, it doesn't mean no. It means not yet. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's a great point. And also to add on to that, all of these people who are making connections for you, they would not make those connections if they didn't know that they could risk their own reputation on you. Yes. So it's so important for, for you to follow through on everything that you say you're going to do, do what you say you're going to do, do a good job, be honest, be, you know, be, have a great reputation. And then other people will they won't feel like it's a risk. They no. won't have that second thought. Well, I don't know if I should do this or not. So. Yeah, and that's very true in, in our business. I mean, there's a reason why, you know, people talk about nepotism in our business, but um, the reason why it's hard to break in because the risks are so high. Yeah. So people don't like to take chances. They just don't, mm -hmm. you know? So once they get in with a group or a director or a writer, or if you're doing film, an AD, a DP, whatever, mm -hmm. You know, once you get in with a group that you trust, it's really hard. For, it's kind of like a family and yeah. you don't really want to bring a stranger off the street into your family because you just don't know what he's going to do. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so you and that's kind of the way the and the industry is. And mm -hmm. and that's really true with any industry because true. You know, because the risks are so high. You just don't know. You know, is he going to be like the biggest thing? Are they going to be on time? Mm -hmm. You know, are they are they going to show up? Can I trust them? You know, yeah. can I, I say, hey, it starts at 10 o'clock. Are you going to be ready to go? Um, and so th those 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 attributes, those qualities are so important that 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 you do everything you possibly can to alleviate some of the anxieties to give mm -hmm. yourself an opportunity. Right. So people yeah. make their own these subconscious judgments. He responds to my email. She responds to my email. Uh, she followed through, uh, you know. A lot of times you can judge someone how they write an email, you know, like, mm -hmm. you, you know, if, if it sounds very professional and if it's kind, sincere, mm -hmm. okay, this person might want to work with, you know, if it's really short and abrupt and not very fluid, not very, there's not very, there's not a, um, 
a sensibility through the email or, or it's just not a good email, then you're less willing to, to take that risk, you know? And so mm -hmm. for younger people in any business, it's, if you can just do as many things, work hard, obviously, but be on time, follow through, write good emails, you know, do everything you can to alleviate some of the anxieties to open the doors. So then you get that opportunity, right? Cause then, yeah. then you get the opportunity and then now you've done all this legwork in the beginning just to give you the opportunity. And then you have to follow through on the opportunity and you don't always have to hit it out of the park. You just can't strike out. Right. You just yeah. have to like, okay, you know, at least in our business, you know, he was a good actor, you know, and was, you know, wasn't the greatest actor. He wasn't, you know, he didn't win an Academy Award, but he, he knew his lines. He came to rehearsal all the time. You know, he was always respectful. He wasn't fighting with anybody. I and mean, that's a big deal. I mean, you, yeah. get, you get divas in the industry and people are fighting and, and you hear it all the time in, in, in major projects, right? Where mm -hmm. they couldn't work with this actor or they couldn't work with this director and they couldn't, you know, and, and projects fall apart and, and, people's egos are massive. And so if you can alleviate all those things, those open doors, again, all of it, it kind of works in conjunction to open doors for yourself. Yeah. And it, that goes back to that old adage. It's not what you know, it's who you know, which sounds awful on the surface because it's like, oh, it doesn't matter what I do because I don't, I'm nobody. I don't have those connections. But like you said, when you do what you're supposed to do and, and um, hone your craft, regardless of what your craft is, even if it's not a regular craft, um, then when you do get the right opportunities, people will recognize that. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you about, so when you, when you, you said that probably being there in 9-11 kind of led to your solo show, well, the mood, I guess the TV series mm -hmm. and the solo show, um, you're not, your family's not military, right? My sister is. My sister oh, served, okay. and okay. I had nieces in the in the reserve. Okay. So my question about this is: a lot of people want to kind of break into a new industry or a new sector or something, and they feel like um, an imposter, or they feel like people aren't going to respect them or trust them because everybody's jaded now. Did you ever feel like that? Like how how do I have the right to tell these stories? These such oh, yeah. personal stories. Oh heck yeah. I yeah. bet, so Heck especially yeah. with the military, because people give so much. So, how did you work through that? You know, um, you just you. Again, I'm really stubborn, and <laughs> I I'm very driven, and so you just have to get really comfortable with the. You know, there's in the military. I'm sure you know this. There's a term called "enjoy the suck." Yes, and <laughs> and, and it's very true when you're working on a project. A lot of times. Um, people don't want to try something new because they don't want to suck at it. Yeah. Right. Or they don't, there, there's a goal or there's a, there's something, a desire they want, but they don't want to suck at it. But if you can just get comfortable in the suck, eventually the suck will stop sucking and you'll get better at it. And then it'll become something that you become proficient at, at it. And so I always knew the way I always approached everything is, well, when I would create a character, I would almost, I would, I would film myself sometimes. Um, I would record and I would study myself. Or I, if I couldn't be even before cameras, I would ask a friend, "Hey, can you watch me on stage and tell me what I'm doing well?" Right. And I was always very, I always had the, uh, the, the strategy of or or the um, the process of like, tell me what sucks, and then I'll fix it right mm -hmm. compared to like i want no one to see my suck yeah so you just when you're doing something you you just have to understand that that voice that tells you you're imposter it's just a voice mm -hmm. and we all have it and you just have to learn how to shut it out and you have to get comfortable in, in watching how you suck at it right and so the more feedback you can get because when i first did the american soldier it sucked it sucked. <laughs> and when I saw it, I thought, oh my gosh, it sucked. It was sucked. that a live performance that yeah. you had an audience? Yeah, it was a live performance. It was a workshop I did, you know. And it oh, was okay. Just, it, sucked. it was just bad. The acting was bad. It was pushed. It was, but I there were moments when I saw something that was like, I, I could that's kind of interesting, right? Right. Yeah. And so so you just have to ignore that voice and just get comfortable with the suck. 
and keep working at it and get feedback, let people mm -hmm. watch it. And obviously for me, it's, it's, you know, I'm in, uh, as an actor, you, I need people to visually watch my stuff or I need to watch my stuff. But if it's a project, share it with people and say, you know, what's, or if it's an idea, what works about this and what doesn't work about it. And doesn't mean you have to take everyone's advice because you don't want to be like, you know, a, you know a, a feather in the wind blowing everywhere. But if someone keeps, if a lot of people give you the same piece of advice, yeah, you should pay attention to it. And I, I had a part in the play that, um, that no one was really getting. Um, I, I, I was speaking about women's breasts a lot, but my point wasn't in a sexual, it was really about the nurturing of guys missing mm -hmm. being from home. Mm -hmm. And it just, it wasn't landing. It, it was sounding, it was, it was sounding really crash and uh, clash and, and just not nice. And, and I kept getting this note from people like, I don't, I don't get why you're always saying that. Right. And so I spoke to a, a playwright who was pretty, fairly successful and he said, look, you don't have to listen to everybody, but if everyone's giving you the exact same note, you should kind of pay attention to it because uh -huh. there's something there. And he was right. Yeah. And so I took it out and then it changed and the play changed and the monologue that I was doing and it changed. And I got in like, now I get why it wasn't working, right? Because it was sounding very sexual and that was not what my intention was. My intention mm -hmm. was to talk about, you know, being so far away removed from being an infant, you know, the nurturing of, you know, what, what a child is to a mother with yeah. being, being fed, being fed, that now he's in, in, in a very different place. Um, but that is true with, you know, it goes back to enjoying the suck. If you could just get comfortable and suck and, and ignore the voice and get as much feedback as you can and let that be a information for you. And mm -hmm. if you get um, the same note over and over and over and over again, you should pay attention to it. You know, it doesn't mean you have to listen to it, but you should pay attention to it because there's something there. And um, I just think a lot of people just, they, they get so intimidated about what other people think. Mm -hmm. And you can get much deeper in this, but, you know, judgments from friends and family are very powerful. Yeah. As much as we don't like to think they are. Um, even people that we kind of, people we respect and know. And so you're always worried and you're always thinking about what are they going to think about what I'm doing or if it's going to be a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and at the end of the day, when we all tend to go, we're going to be holding, if we're blessed, our sons and our daughters and our spouses' hands none of the people you think that you care about are going to be holding your hand when you're going. Sure. And, that's for sure. Yeah. And, and so if you could just remember that, you know, it doesn't really matter. The only thing that matters is what you think yeah. uh, and not worry so much about what your friends and your high school friends or your college friends or your colleagues think, because they, they don't care. And, and to be honest with you, we're all so wrapped up in our own obstacles and, and challenges that, I mean, whatever Lisa does, I'm not thinking about, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and whatever I do, you're not thinking about. Mm -hmm. And so people just get so caught up in what other people's opinions are that they, um, they, uh, they stifle themselves. They inhibit themselves, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I, especially in my business, you know, you, you always hear like, I wanted to write a book or I wanted to write a play. Well, write it. You know, mm -hmm. I wanted to act, well, act, you know, yeah. you, you know, why act. not? That's why, why not? I wrote, that's why I wrote the book disrupt your now, because I'm like, People are always saying one day and someday. And I'm like, one day and someday never come. Figure yeah. out what it is that you want out of life and then figure out things that you can do that move you in that direction. It doesn't have to be quit your job and go do this whole thing and disrupt your life, but disrupt your now, disrupt the way that you're thinking and start looking at things differently. Yeah, that's a great point. And then the other th th to follow through, to follow up on that is um, you have to plan it. Yes. Right. Cause if you know, the days go by and um, and if you have kids or if you have, if you have a partner, life gets in the way. Yeah. And it goes from one day to six weeks to six weeks to six months to six months to six years. And you still haven't done it. And you're like, where did the time go? And all Just, of a sudden, yeah, you're elderly and you're like, man, I wish I had done that. Yeah. Oh, so many people, you know, and I knew in New York, <coughs> I, I, I won't bring up her name, but she was from, where was she from? 
St. Louis, I believe. She was from St. Louis. And I, she went to Ole Miss, and she, I was casting a play, and she auditioned for it. And she had the kind of the right look. I didn't cast her, but uh, I saw she was from Ole Miss, and we developed a friendship, you know. And uh, she was much younger than me. And I didn't know this, but, I mean, she could sing like an angel. I mean, like an angel. When I heard her sing, it was like God had – sent his most beautiful angels into her vocal cords. It was, uh, you know, you know, you ever hear someone sing and you're just like, wow. Yeah. How do you do that? Like you have been blessed with an unbelievable talent. And she was, she wanted to do musicals. That's why she was in New York. And I, I remember her going, I really want to do musicals. And her acting wasn't up to par. And her parents had this weird idea that she had to make it in six months or she had to come home. They were paying mm -hmm. for her bills. Yeah. And I was like, man, you're putting tremendous pressure on your sick. I mean, <laughs> no one makes it in six months in any field, <laughs> much less the, much less on Broadway. And, you know, mm -hmm. you have the talent. I mean, there's no, and she, so she would get, when she would audition for national, uh, uh, Broadway uh, productions, they would call her back because you would hear her voice yeah. and you're like, but her acting was not up to par. And so what happens is for a musical, the a musical artist, you know, you, you first sing and they like your singing and then they give you a, then they give you a scene to act in. And then they want to, and then that's what separates, separates you. So, mm -hmm. you, you know, you want to be able to act and sing, you know, and if you're more blessed, triple threat, you know, act, sing and dance. And so she could never act. So she quit. She quit the business after oh. six months. She left. And I always thought, my gosh, what a travesty. Because if she would have stuck it with an, with acting, I she would have been, a, I truly believe she would have been a star. Wow. She, she would have been stars. So she went back to St. Louis. She got married. She has two kids. I'm sure she has a great mm -hmm. life. I'm, uh, I'm sure she's very happy. But I know the pressures her parents gave her to not follow through her dreams. And mm -hmm. I would have to bet I don't really talk to her much anymore we're connected on facebook but i would have to bet one day there's many moments when she's sitting she's sitting down on the couch having a glass of wine or looking out the window where she's wondering what if what if yeah what if, what if? and the thing is most of the deadlines that we or our parents or whoever put on ourselves are so arbitrary they are where'd you come up with this number and i'm sure in her parents minds they were thinking like you said the money and this that and the other and they probably thought oh acting and you know this is a boondoggle or whatever um but yeah so that that's i just I, i'm sure she does have a wonderful life like you said but yes yeah, she's got to be sitting there thinking what if what if yeah. i've done this yeah and, I'm, and I, I know she was feeling pressures from you know she was a very typical midwest girl you know her, uh yeah. Uh, you know, she probably had friends who were getting married already and mm -hmm. starting their lives, you know, and she was living, you know, kind of like a pauper because that's what you do in New York when you're yep. starting out, you know, and, <laughs> you know, and she was basically, you know, putting that kind of pressure on herself. Mm -hmm. And I mean, when I, there's days when me and my wife, because my wife knew her as well, when we talk about her, she sang, uh, we knew she can sing and we were, we were having people over at our apartment and she, I said, can you just, sing happy birthday wow when i tell you that everyone was like what was that that's amazing i mean it it, it was like her sound was crystal clear you know like it was there was just like she she can go high and control it it, it was an instrument she literally it's like mm -hmm. someone stuck a, an instrument inside her i mean singing is an instrument but she had yeah. such a gift with her vocal cords ah. and I'm sure she goes to church and sings and I'm sure someone goes, what the heck is that? <laughs> she, was, she was amazing. And I um, know yeah. anyway, I wish her the well, I wish her the best, but again, it goes back to what we were saying. You know, you people put these, these pressures on themselves and they worry about what other people think. And I really, at the end of the day, mm -hmm. you know, her parents are going to pass because we're all going to pass. And one day she's going to be going, Hmm, I wish I would have, you know, gone after my dreams, you know, yeah. um, and I wish I would have gave myself a more of a chance, at least six months. What, what the heck exactly. Is, what yeah. is six months? I mean, that's, mm -hmm. it's nothing. That's like, you know, it's not even on the starting gate. So it, yeah, especially in that field. Um, I want to ask you, so 
you had that solo show. How did that turn into the commission or the second show with the Library of Congress? So I had, had been performing the American Soldier for a couple of years. So I did the Library of Congress in 2018. And um, they heard about it. Uh, okay. You know, by the time I by time by 2018, I had been working on the American Soldier for now for almost almost eight nine years already. Because I, I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I was really singing. You know, singing in the dark in the dark forest. You know, trying to find my way out. You know, mm -hmm. and now I know what to do. I have a process when I write. But back then, I was not a writer. And I didn't. You know, uh, I going back to my insecurities. I I, I always thought I sucked at English. Um, uh, I had a, you know, this is how powerful teachers are. I had a teacher who in uh, fourth grade, fifth grade, I can't remember because you're not very good at English. Uh. And, and and it stuck with me. It's it like it, it scarred me. And yeah. so I, I always was always trying to get out of English class. And the moment in college, the moment I can not take English, I, I didn't take it. Little did I know that I would be surrounded becoming a student of English. Isn't that crazy? It's funny how life is. But yeah. um uh, so someone had heard about it and Naomi, she was a curator at the library of Congress. So 2018 was the hundred year cent centennial for the ending of the uh, first world war, which was 1918. Mm -hmm. The veteran for people who don't know veterans day is celebrated on November 11th, um, because of Armistice day when the last shot was taken during the first world war on November 11th at 11 AM mm -hmm. of, of, of the 11th hour. And mm -hmm. so, she said, hey, you know, we want to do this a special centennial for um, uh, to celebrate the ending of the First World War. Would you consider, you know, adding a monologue to your play and would you like to perform it there? And I was like, I mean, you know, that's not the way plays work. You know, that's kind of this. It's like unbaking a cake. You know, you can't <laughs> you can't unbake a cake and mm -hmm. add different flavors to it. It's already baked. <laughs> so she said, well, would you consider writing a play for us? Um, so she heard about it. I think I had performed at the Kennedy Center in 2016, and that's how they heard about it. Because mm. in 2016, I, someone referred me to the Kennedy Center, and I performed when uh, Donald, Tr Donald Trump got elected, which was insane in 2016. Because you had the Women's Rock March and people protesting. I mean, mm. DC was a madhouse. So I, she heard about it there, I think through press, and um, and she asked me, you know we'll give you these diaries. You can pick any diary you want from soldiers who served in the first world war. And we would love to, you know, have you write a play about it. And so I said, no, at first I said, there's, cause they only gave me like six months or seven months. Mm -hmm. and I was like, there's no way I can do this. I mean, it's just impossible. It took me like eight years to do the American soldier seven, mm -hmm. six months. I don't know what I'm doing. My wife who has been a big partner throughout this whole process. She said, look, if the Library of Congress tells you to write a play, you write a play. <laughs> yeah. And so I did. And so I said yes. And I just kind of put tunnel vision. And that's all I did. I would, it was 400 and I think it was 435 entries. And I read it every morning, every evening, reading, reading the whole diary. And it was based off of Irving Greenwald, who was a runner. Uh, he was a Hungarian Jew from the upper, uh, um, uh, uh, from up, uh, up, uh, from up in Harlem, up in New York, and he um, he volunteered mm -hmm. uh, and to fight in the First World War, and he was part of the Lost Battalion. For people who don't know the Lost Battalion, until Restrepo up in Afghanistan, the Lost Battalion had taken more casualties than any battalion in any of the American conflicts, even with Second mm -hmm. World War. They were trapped between the Argonne Forest, and um, they were taking artillery shells from from the Germans and from the Americans. And they're called the lost battalion because we lost, we lost control. We lost, in, we lost touch with them. Uh. So if you ever go to the Smithsonian, the pigeon that saved them, because they, the way they used to communicate were either through runners, radio wire and pigeons. They would throw mm -hmm. pigeons up in the air. A lot of times the radio wire wasn't very uh, uh, consistent because they would, you know, the first thing they would artillery shells would blow up would be the radio wires. Yeah. So then, so then they would send runners out. So if you see 1917, they have the whole movie's based on two runners trying to get information across. Um, and so he was a runner. Um, but the pigeon that finally saved him has a, a phrase that says, in God, for, for God's sake, stop killing us. Oh, and wow. The, and the Americans finally realize, oh, shoot, we've been bombing our own men. And so if you ever go to the Smithsonian, you can see the pigeon there. 
Um, but that's the pigeon that saved them. But um, that's cool. Yeah. So so they you know they said, hey, you know, would you write this? So I did it, and it was beautiful. It was it was an amazing experience. Uh, so those two solo shows. Is there anywhere that people like me can watch? Like, is there like a paid version? Yeah, I think the lot, I think the I mean I think the Library of Congress they they videoed both of them, and I think if you go to their website, okay. uh, you can um, I can share a link later. And I think, okay, I think you can watch them both. And I, the Kennedy Center recorded my performances, and so they have them. If you go to the Kennedy Center, the American Soldier, that'll pop up. And okay, cool. And yeah, I really need to watch those. My husband and I were saying the other night that we need to rewatch Landing Home because we were both so touched by that. He He's a retired Navy. He's actually a Vietnam veteran. He was over there three years. He's 14 and a half years older than me. So um, and that was one thing that we did during COVID is we did a little pinning ceremony over Zoom for him because they were having the um, basically the welcome home to Vietnam veterans that they never got. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, we were all stuck at home and couldn't do it. So I got the pin in my family all over the country. We got on zoom. And I always say when I meet a Vietnam vet, I always say, welcome home. Yeah. And, and I was, I wanted to read. So I, I've become really good friends with a lot of the Vietnam vets. Um, it's strange, but I've become really close friends with a lot of Vietnam vets. And there's one guy, this guy, he touches me so much. His name is Joseph Reynolds. He served in Vietnam. He sends me a card all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I just finished doing a, long, a lot of tours, and he, he sent me a play called, uh, I sent, he's, he's Irish, and he sent me a little, I don't know if you, people can see, uh, how can I see it? Yeah, a little uh -huh. shamrock, you know, yeah. little, little shamrock, and he sends me, his name is Joseph Reynolds, mm -hmm. and I have to kind of, I want to give him some air time because he's so such an amazing it says, I treasure your friendship. A friend is a gift whose worth cannot be measured except by the heart. A P.S. Douglas, rub the good luck shamrock when, your needs, when you need a boost. Thanks for your continually uh, motivating veterans like myself in a position in a positive way. Always, Joe. Douglas, happy St. Patrick's Day happy, uh, and happiness always. And he's always, um, of all the gifts and the, and the life can send, there's more treasure than a friend, a friend who smile in thoughtful ways and happiness at passing days, mm -hmm. a friend who shares and comforts too. In other words, a friend like you. And he sends me these long letters Aww. sometimes and he's, uh, he's just been so special, you know. Um, That's so sweet. And you yeah. never know who you're going to touch through what you do. It, even if no. you're not creative like what you do, you just never know when... And for me, back there, uh, people can see those are all letters and notes. And, and you can't see, but there's medals. There's probably over 40, 50 challenge coins that people have given yeah. me. And that people can see that rendering back there of that soldier right there. Yeah. Uh, that was in Virginia. I just performed. I was in Radford. Virginia. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I went to school at Virginia Tech over in Blacksburg. Yeah, and so I performed and she... Uh, um, a, uh, a vet, a vet drew that for me. And, and so, yeah, oh. there are these special moments and there's probably a handful of vets that I've over the years that I've become really good friends with and they still send me emails and texts. And it's, um, yeah, it's been, it, it's been a blessing that I could have never in a million years have ever, ever imagined when That's I That's really play. cool. <clears throat> That's another thing that I tell younger people who are so worried about what am I going to do? What am I going to be when I grow up? What am I going to study? And oh. I'm always like, Whatever you think you're going to do, you're not, it's not going to end up being. No, what, I mean, I, I, I thought I was going to be a chef. I mean, oh, really? I, yeah, and even when you got into acting, you never would have dreamed that you would have been doing these solo shows. So it's like. I, my dad was a chef and that was my passion is cooking. Oh, wow. And I was, and it wasn't for that girl breaking up with me. I would have been in the kitchen somewhere. Because when and I was waiting. Like, Thank you for breaking up with me, right? <laughs> yeah, I think so. But I still, I mean, I have a, it's, it's one of my biggest passion is cooking. I cook all the time. And um, uh, <clears throat> my dad, who he was a, you know, he worked, he was a merchant Marine and he worked on oil tankers. But when he started his career, he worked for the Beverly Hills Hotel way back, 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 back. Oh, when. wow. Because I was actually born in LA. Okay. And, um, so he, yeah, he, he worked at the Beverly Hills Hotel. And so, um, I used to work at a very fancy restaurant in Houston called Charlie's 517. And I understood 
rhythm really well and I understood service really well because of my dad and I understood food really well. So I became really good friends with the head chef who was a Michelin star, a French restaurant, a French chef. And he was trying to get me to come back. I was, I was at that time, I was a captain waiting tables because I speak fluent Spanish. So being in Houston, you know, I mean, it was such a fancy restaurant. They don't have these restaurants anymore, but, uh, you know, French style service, you know, you had a, it was a, a three, three team waiting staff, you know, cause you had a captain, you had a, 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 a wine, you had a wine waiter and you had a, and you had a bus boy, uh, and you had a runner, right? So it was these really fancy restaurants and crazy, but, um, but they they were like you know we want you to we want you to come behind the line we want you to cook and they want they want they were going to train me to be a, a cook and my dad was like don't you dare get behind the line he says once you get behind the line you'll never get out oh and, god and no so I, escape I, yeah he's and he, and he i mean he kind of saved me because if if i would have gotten behind the line i would have probably been very good at it i would have fallen in love with it and i would have never chosen acting but because That's i didn't funny. yeah but yeah, yeah. so but yeah, it's yeah, yeah. I, I thought I was going to be a chef. I mean, I that was literally my goal. My goal was to be a chef. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's so funny. Yeah. Well, Douglas, I have had, I've enjoyed talking with you so much. I feel like I could sit here and talk with you all day, though. Oh, thank you. We, you know, you're you're. I know we've never really met in person, but you're, I consider you as a friend, and you've always been really supportive and really kind. And I wish you and. Your husband, nothing but the best. And Thank I really, you. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Yeah. And I thank you so much for coming on. And I love following you and seeing everything that you're doing. And just, I, I treasure your friendship, even though it's virtual long distance. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. And just summarize for everybody, you know, just like, as you said, as you shared, you know, follow through, um, be on time, work hard. and. Um, and, and cherish every single opportunity and, uh, and ignore the voices, yeah. ignore, ignore the voices because they don't do you any good. Well, that's a great wrap up. I love it. So tell everybody how they can find out more about you and, um, sure. Uh, well, I, the website is the American soldier solo show.com. Um, the American soldier solo show.com. And then on social media, you can follow me at Douglas Terrell. I'm on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, obviously. Um, and just follow me on social media or, and I, and if anybody cares about the play and the message, please go to the website, get on the email list. Cause it, I cherish those lists and I like sharing stories about how I perform and how I travel through the arteries of the country and, and how I, you know, the importance of giving a voice to men and women who have served and their families. So, yeah. Yeah, I do encourage y'all to get on the email list. It's interesting. It's not typical email where you're like, <laughs> yeah. you know. <laughs> I know. I try, I, and I try to make it entertaining, but sometimes I wonder, oh, man, is this too long? Is this, no, you know, you're no. always wondering, but, but I love sharing the stories and I love writing. So, well, and here's the thing if it's too long, then that's not your target. You yeah. know, the people, in, you don't need everybody, you need the people that are the right audience for you one last thing landing home is still streaming right um, yeah yes thank you and yeah. yeah and if you want to watch the tv series you can watch it landing home um the the website is landing home the web series dot landing home web series dot com but you can watch it on amazon it's on google play it's on apple it's on tubi and voodoo mm -hmm. and um yeah if you type in landing home tv series it'll pop up everywhere and you can watch it there and th yeah and if you can support it there they're great you know it, it's very inexpensive it's like five bucks and it, all the money it basically just goes into um, um a, a possibility for a second season okay well thank you so much douglas it was great talking with you and i'm excited to watch you and see what you do in the future thank you lisa and i wish i really sincerely wish you and your husband nothing but the best thank you so much bye-bye see y'all next week everybody bye everyone